Good morning. Welcome to Our Savior Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Johnson, and this is the Pastor's Bible Class. So today we are continuing on in our journey of Joshua. And it was wonderful to see last time the hand of the Lord in action as he guided Israel to victory. Imagine this once enslaved people now growing into a truly united nation under Joshua's leadership. But God himself, as we learned last time, God himself is their true commander and success depended upon remaining within his will. At each step of their journey, God himself clearly stated what must be destroyed and what must remain for the use of the nation. Joshua chapter 6. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Now, even if you didn't read on, the knowledgeable person of human nature could guess what happens next. Well, someone stole what was not his, what was destined to be the Lord's. And he brought it into his tent, and that thing became an accursed thing. The Israelites prepared for battle in the meantime to continue their occupation into the promised land. They prepared to take Ai. The scouts reported that it should be taken easily. They told Joshua that there was no need to send the whole army. They said, just send a few. It, it should be an easy task. What should have been easy, though, was not. The men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So Joshua was crestfallen. He spent the night with God, and he, he was right before the Ark of the Covenant, and God spoke to him, and God revealed the problem. Achan brought an accursed thing into the camp. Now, Achan confessed. Joshua did speak kindly to him, almost like a father speaks to a son. But nevertheless, punishment, now severe by our standards, had to be meted out. Achan, his family, and all of his livestock were stoned, and then they were burned. Nothing was to remain but stones as a memorial, so the people might remember there is a cost to disobedience. An interesting discussion point arising from this section of the story might be, what's the relationship between forgiveness and consequences? If you forgive someone who wronged you, would it mean that he's absolved of all his responsibility to make restitution, to pay a fine, to lose a job, to serve jail time, or even pay the ultimate price by giving his life? Perhaps Achan's soul is saved, but Joshua must be a leader and he must administer punishment. So they went up again to defeat Ai, but this time with a bit of strategy, and more importantly, they were in the strength of the Lord, and as such, they were successful. They destroyed what God told them to destroy, and they kept what God allowed them to keep in service to the nation. An altar was built, sacrifices were made. Then the entire Torah with blessings and curses was read. Now, what do you suppose the blessings and curses may have been? The, bless the blessings and the curses is another way of saying, I think, law and gospel. This is the text. 
There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Definitely, there must have been gospel, even revelations concerning the Christ in this part of the Torah, the law of Moses. For what scriptures did Jesus teach to his disciples as they were on the road to Emmaus? And he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 25 to 27. Now, to whom was this law, this Torah, proclaimed? That's an important part of this verse, too. As we want to better understand these terms, though, law and gospel, I emphasize that there is a broad and there is a narrow sense of these terms. But to whom was it proclaimed? Well, the assembly of Israel, the women and the little ones, and the sojourners who dwelt among them. As I think of little toddlers, the little ones surrounding with their parents and the older people listening to this incredibly long um, announcement reading of the law. I wonder if the little ones were somehow different than little ones today. Well, I doubt it. Still, they worship as a full congregation, men, women, and children together. In our times, many congregations, including our own, struggle with this model to worship all together. Older people, younger people, men, women, children, teens, all together. I remember an older man in our congregation mentioning how unreasonable it was to bring a child into an adult environment. But here, there was no distinction which set aside an adult and then a childhood type of environment. Worship is for the entire congregation. As we look to social history, we discover that this concept of childhood and having a very firm demarcation between childhood and adulthood is just wasn't something shared by every culture in every time and every place. Perhaps we might be induced to place greater value on children in worship. This would be a good discussion point and something that I'm going to bring up in our Sunday phone-in discussion. And there the Torah was also read before the sojourners, the travelers, the resident aliens, the foreigners. There's a multiplicity of ways you can translate the word, but they were not Israelites, at least not born that way. In this verse, we might see that there were a number, I don't know how many, but there were a number who were not born as Israelites, but were being incorporated into Israel from the nations. So as it would seem, as Israel was occupying the land, um, Rahab, of course, and her entire family. But it would seem that there were um, a few others as well that sort of entered in and were willing to become part of Israel. Well, more would become part of Israel. There was a mission to the Gentiles um, that was also going on. Israel, you see, was gaining quite a reputation in the region. The surrounding cities knew what was coming. Would they stand and fight? I mean, it was incredible. They had the Lord with them. Would they stand and fight? Or would they see the strength of the Lord working through the Israelites? Now, the Gibeonites, 
seeing the futility of resistance, they sought to negotiate a peace. Now, they were not very forthcoming concerning who they were, how close their cities actually were. Now, their cities were Gibeon and a few others. Did they actually lie or were they just good negotiators? The narrative depicts them as cunning. Well, you could translate that or understand that as wisdom. What else were they to do? They offered, so they offered themselves as servants of Israel. And so they became these hewers of wood and drawers of water. And those who have heard this phrase in the context of Canadian politics, a light will probably go off in your head because it comes up uh, quite frequently. The biblical phrase was first used by a minister of finance, Leonard Tilly, in 1879. The time has arrived, he said, when we are to decide whether we will be simply hewers of wood and drawers of water, or will rise to the position which I believe providence has destined us to occupy. Tilly was complaining that we Canadians we're allowing ourselves to be exploited in our resources, in our manpower, and never manufacturing our own goods, keeping money in our own country. But you know, in 2014, we were still hewers of wood and drawers of water, since a good 64% of our G, uh, G, gross national product comes from raw resources sold now mostly oil. So these Gibeonites are kind of our, Can our forefathers for us Canadians in a, in a certain way. They were hewers of wood and drawers of water for the Israelites. I guess we're hewers of wood and drawers of water for the Americans and for maybe the world. Nevertheless, these Gibeonites, they were incorporated into the people of God, willingly sharing the true faith and their children growing up to be every bit an Israelite. Throughout the Torah, there is provision for the foreigner who dwells among the people of God. And these foreigners are expected to be taught and ultimately to become an Israelite. And if they didn't like it, they could leave. The Gibeonites chose negotiation, while others banded together to fight. So, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Horeb, king of Hebron, and Piram, king of Jarmuth, to Japiah, king of Lachish, and to Debar, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon for it has made peace with Joshua and lift the people of Israel. Joshua chapter 10, verses three and four. Well, what happened next? You do well to anticipate that the Israelites would protect the Gibeonites, honoring their covenant with them, and they were triumphant in battle. But what is truly memorable in this chapter is how God chose to intervene. A reading further from chapter 10, verse 11. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones then the sons of Israel killed with the sword. But you haven't heard anything yet. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still. And the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? 
the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole entire day. There has been no day like it before or since, when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Chapter 10, verses 12 to 14. This is one of the most important miracles that we need to stop at. It's amazing. So we just feel like we need to take a step back to consider, ponder for a while. So join us next time as we continue in Joshua chapter 10. In the meantime, take a look at the discussion questions which follow. I look forward to our phone-in conference Sunday morning at 10 a.m.